All right, we're back to wrap up our chapter six lectures with just a few details here at the end. We're going to talk about carbocation rearrangements one more time. We already kind of went over this information, but it's just good to know and give you kind of a strategy to figure out uh, whether or not a carbocation will rearrange. And then we'll talk about how we know whether these steps are reversible or irreversible when we draw out the steps of a, a chemical mechanism. So uh, again, we, we mentioned this before, but it's good to review. Whenever you see a carbocation, you have to figure out if between hydride or methyl, uh, methide shift, if you're going to result in a more stable carbocation. If the answer is no, then the rearrangement won't occur. But if the answer is yes, in other words, moving a methyl group one carbon over or moving a hydrogen one carbon over, uh, then it will rearrange. So like, let's take a look at this one. So look at this one, look at the carbocation. Now look at its neighbors. You've got a neighbor to the left and a neighbor to the right. Ask yourself, is there any way that it could rearrange to form a more stable tertiary carbocation? This one's secondary. So the only way it would be more stable is with a tertiary carbocation. Well, one way that you can figure it out is just draw in the hydrogens that you know are on the neighbors. You know it has to be from a neighboring uh, carbon. So just draw in the hydrogens like that. And then this one has a hydrogen as well. So if we look at the one on the left here, if we imagine a hydride shift this way, uh, what we'd end up with is we'd end up with a secondary carbocation. Well, we already have a secondary carbocation. So there's no reason for this shift to occur. So that's not gonna happen. But <clears throat> if we look at the right side and we imagine moving this hydride over like so, that forms a tertiary carbocation. So that is gonna happen actually. So this is the correct answer here. This is a case where we would have a rearrangement. So yeah, so that just kind of shows you through the process. This is a step-by-step -step list of what I exactly just did here. Just identify the hydrogens uh, and methyl groups that are on the neighboring carbon atoms, and then determine if, if you shifted one of them, would it give you a more stable carbocation? And sure enough, like in this case, we had a hydride shift and that's what occurred. Now, uh, we also had an example where um, we formed an allylic carbocation. That's always something to look out for. Um, so tertiary carbocations usually won't rearrange unless you form a allylic carbocation. So like this tertiary carbocation, if it undergoes hydride shift, you form an allylic tertiary carbocation and that's resonance stabilized. So that's gonna be more stable. So just always keep an eye out looking for the allylic carbocations because those are gonna be resonance stabilized. Okay, now the last section of the chapter just talks about how do we know if these steps are reversible or irreversible? Uh, and we'll just go through some examples here for you. So like sometimes when we, when we draw individual steps, like here we have a proton transfer from uh, our um, ketone here, our cyclic ketone to an alkoxide, this proton transfer is reversible. In other words, you can deprotonate this or this can get its proton back uh, from the alcohol that did. So we have to write a reversible arrow here. On the other hand, if we have uh, this carbanion here and this carbanion uh, acts as a nucleophile onto this electrophilic carbon, you form a new carbon-carbon bond, that's an irreversible step. So um, we just wanna keep in mind, like as we look at the different steps of a mechanism and we'll go through several rules here that'll tell us whether it's reversible or irreversible, that's gonna help us know which type of arrow to draw. Is it reversible or the irreversible arrow? And yeah, it's, it's both kinetic and thermodynamic concerns, right? If a reaction is so slow that, or if the reverse reaction is so slow that it doesn't occur, then it'd be irreversible. And um, if, you know, at the same time, the thermodynamics are such that the products are much more stable than the reactants, uh, then yeah, that's also thermodynamically irreversible. Okay, so here's the deal. So starting from nucleophilic attack, so if the nucleophile that attacks is also a good leaving group, then that's a reversible attack. So here we have water as our nucleophile, that's H2O, that does a nucleophilic attack, you form a new carbon oxygen bond. But when this leaves, it leaves as water, H2O. That's a stable molecule, and that's indeed a good leaving group. The same thing is true, for example, with like bromide or iodide or chloride. Those are all decent leaving groups. And so you would have a reversible attack of a nucleophile if any of those halides did. 
And yeah, the word is here just basically the loss of a leaving group occurs at a, a rate that does make a difference. On the other hand, if you have a nucleophile that's a bad leaving group, in other words, the nucleophile itself is unstable, uh, it's gonna be an irreversible attack. In this case, what happens is we have a carbanion as a nucleophile, and those are pretty unstable. They'll pick up protons from anywhere. So it's not gonna act as a good leaving group, but it's gonna act as a very strong nucleophile. So you have a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon that forms, uh, that breaks the pi bond here so that we don't violate the octet rule. And now all of a sudden we're here and this is a really terrible leaving group. So the reverse process is not gonna occur. Because uh, this would be ridiculous. You'd have a, uh, a new carbon oxygen pi bond form and then just have a carb anion form. This is extremely unstable. So that's just not gonna happen. Okay. So uh, when you have the lose, loss of a leaving group, that's almost always reversible. So anytime you draw in the loss of a leaving group step, that's gonna be a reversible reaction um, because almost all leaving groups that you have are gonna be good nucleophiles. There's like a couple exceptions, but we'll talk about those in particular when we get to those, uh, when it becomes relevant. So yeah, so this is a good leaving group and it's also a good nucleophile. I mentioned that already for bromide, iodide, chloride, um, and fluoride, I guess, to some extent. Okay, now, so that's loss of leaving group, always reversible. Proton transfers are reversible, but if the pKa difference is 10 or more, it can be considered irreversible. For example, here, we have a carbanion in water. The pKa of water is 15.7. The pKa of an alkane is like 50. So this difference in pKa is huge. It's, this is a much, much weaker acid than the water. So that means that the equilibrium is gonna heavily, heavily lie on the product side. In fact, so much so that you wouldn't expect to really see any of the reactant side. This is gonna be an irreversible reaction. On the other hand, if you have an alkoxide in water, this is tert butoxide in water, uh, their pKa's are pretty close. It's 15.7 and 18. So while we expect the equilibrium to lie slightly towards the products, we're still gonna have an appreciable amount of water and tert butoxide in solution. So this would be an example of a reversible proton transfer. So just kind of play it by ear. Uh, you'll always have access to your pKa chart as well. So you can use that as a guide to guess like what the difference in the pKa's should be. Um, carbocation rearrangements are irreversible. That's because uh, of course you form a more stable carbocation when you do a arrangement, like if you do it correctly. If you do it wrong, then obviously you messed up. But if you do it correctly, then you're ending up with a much more thermodynamically stable carbocation. And so there's no reason that you'd ever do the opposite rearrangement. So carbocation rearrangements are irreversible. Now there's one other thing that we have to consider when it comes to uh, equilibrium. Uh, you also have to consider Le Chatelier's principle. It shows up every so often, like for example here, we have sort of a proto um, azide group here where um, we have these nitrogen, nitrogen double bonds. And this is kind of like a, a very useful unit because what can happen here is you can form a nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond and then break the carbon nitrogen bond. And that means that these nitrogen atoms leave as nitrogen gas. And it leaves you with a carbon ion here. So this is, um, so this forms a gas and that leaves. Well, the reverse reaction can't occur because in solution, you don't have the nitrogen. It's just bubbled out of solution. So when you form a gas like nitrogen or CO2, for example, it escapes the mixture and that's an irreversible reaction. I'll try to point that out when it becomes relevant. More often we'll see CO2 escape rather than nitrogen, but just an example. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and do our first practice. This is the end of the chapter now. Go ahead, take a look at this um, reaction. What I want you to do is draw in the curved arrow mechanism. It's just one step, so whichever step is uh, appropriate, and then draw in the reversible or irreversible reaction arrow. Um, I'll just go ahead and say pause, and then we'll draw it in together when you come back. So go ahead, pause the video. And we're back. So let's go ahead and say, let's just take a look at what we have here. We have a carbocation plus water, and then in the end, we end up with a new carbon oxygen bond from the carbon carbocation to the oxygen and water. So clearly what happened was a nucleophilic attack. We formed our new car oxygen carbon bond because the lone pair from oxygen um, formed a new, basically formed a bonding interaction with this carbon here. And that gives us this here. 
Now, this is a attack of a nucleophile, nucleophilic attack. So the rule is if the nucleophile that attacks, which is water, is also a good leaving group, then it's reversible. If it's not a good leaving group, then it's irreversible. So in this case, we can see the leaving group would be water. And as I mentioned, water is a very stable molecule. So it's a stable leaving group. That means the reverse reaction will occur, the loss of a leaving group at an appreciable rate. So that means we have a reversible reaction like that. All right, we have a bunch more practice down below this lecture. So get to that, work on that. And uh, I will be uh, available for questions. Make sure to ask any questions in the comments down below and I'll get to you right away. And uh, yeah, well, with that, that does chapter six. Um, and I will talk to you soon. So thank you so much and bye-bye.